Next we have Bernard Holland and Catherine Crowden. Bernard has been the CEO of the Southwest NRM in Queensland for 18 months, where he inherited the Collaborative Area Management Project. Bernard has a background in environmental NGO work and was the director of EcoSchools, the largest global environmental education program, which is now in 57 countries. He's the founder of the EcoSchools World Days of Action. Catherine graduated from Murdoch University in 2013 and last year started as the project officer for collaborative area management with Southwest NRM. She studied conservation, wildlife biology and environmental management, has a passion for Australian biodiversity and a keen interest in bilby conservation. This is her first job in the environmental agricultural sector and she's excited about her project and hopes one day to see the concept adopted in other parts of Australia. Thank you everybody and uh, it's great to have uh, Catherine here who's been leading this project. I guess uh, the key thing comes down to history. Uh, this is a project I've inherited on the, I guess, the foresight of the former uh, CEO, uh, Neil Judd, and I think it's one that's going to really change the face of Western Queensland as we see uh, many submissions coming in for cluster fencing. We know that sheep are very important for the multiplier effect in the econo local economy. We know that sheep was a significantly uh, economic adv um, advantageous uh, production animal for Western Queensland and southwestern Queensland, and we know that is no longer happening in the numbers or the quantity or the quality uh, that we used to have. Two key things, grazing pressure and predatory animals. Southwest NRM first of all started two clusters here using its own funds to drive the concept of farmers, graziers, working together to deal with common issues. The state government recognised the quality of this project and has since auspice programs into the South Tambo cluster, which has now finished its project under seven months by working together to erect this fence. The Tomo Creek cluster, which is 60% through the construction of a predator-proof predator fence, and we've now auspiced funds into four more cluster areas across the landscape to complete the three-year project. We anticipate that the erection of the cluster area fence will take another 12 months to do. The total hectares is probably a little bit misleading. It's almost over 18, 1,845,000 1, hectares, almost 2,500 kilometres of fence, with co-contribution from landowners and the grant. I'll hand you over to Catherine, who will explore, explore uh, the finer details of that. Thanks, Bernard. Okay, so why do land managers need these fences? Uh, the key reasons are the total grazing pressure and predation. Unmanaged grazing pressure affects agricultural industry by impacting on ground cover, soil erosion uh, and water supplies, amongst other things, which in turn can also have a negative impact on native animals that use that ground cover for uh, refuge from predation. This can then impact on the biodiversity in these areas as well. Total grazing pressure consists of that applied by both domestic and wild stock, which can include macropods and feral species such as goats and pigs. The level of grazing pressure applied by non-domestic animals can actually increase grazing intensity by up to 50% in some areas. And these pest species are able to maintain high numbers across pastoral lands where there's access to artificial water points. It's hoped that this exclusion fencing will assist in reducing total grazing pressure by limiting access to pasture by this wild stock and allowing land managers to better manage uh, grazing pressure, safeguarding that the sustainable capacity of rangelands are not surpassed. This will also aid in the maintenance of the proper functioning of ecosystems and the survival of native species. Uh, predation by pest species, especially wild dogs and feral pigs, is a problem for both the sheep and the cattle industries. And in Queensland alone for 2008-2009, the major economic costs associated with wild dogs and the grazing industry added up to over $67 million. This includes costs that are associated with disease spread, maintenance of the wild dog barrier fence and livestock losses. Uh, this is a list of native species um, that are preyed upon by wild dogs and artificial water points assist in the increase in the range and the size of predator populations um, that prey on both the livestock and the native animals. Wild dogs are a declared pest and have been regulated under Queensland legislation since 1885. Techniques that are currently being used to control wild dog populations are baiting, trapping, shooting and exclusion fencing. 
And it's ideal for these cluster exclusion fencing um, projects to be used in conjunction with these other techniques um, to both remove wild dogs from an area and to prevent reinfestation. The project is about getting people to work together and in increasingly isolated CEOs of their own country who don't talk to neighbours because the neighbours perhaps don't exist or are on multiple properties. It is a real struggle trying to get people to work together to yet debate, let alone build and maintain a barrier fence. Here's a little excerpt from Channel 9's report. A last chance. There's no future for us without a fence like this. They're building what's called a cluster fence that will enclose 18 individual but massive grazing properties. How unusual is it for graziers to get, get together and work together on the one project? Yeah, it's, it's a new thing, I think, but the fact that we've all got a common goal is probably what's brought us together. And They're doing it primarily because of these wild dogs that kill their livestock. Oh, very serious. Um, we're talking no lambing and no kids for the last couple of years. And we've been losing 900 round sheep per year. On Dundee Station, surrounding graziers gap. They're working together. Very, very uh, unusual. They're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 kilometres away from each other. They don't come together that often. It's a huge project, more than 200 kilometres of fence to keep out the wild dogs and the kangaroos. That your livelihood in the future depends on this fence? Oh, oh, yeah, 100%. Before each section of new fence is built, the old one has to come down. But they know they have no choice, even though it's costing more than a million dollars. While the state government, through South West Natural Resource Management, is subsidising the project, each of these graziers is still spending thousands of their own money. It is painstaking work, even with the post hoc digging machinery to help them. They're still only moving at a rate of about one and a half kilometres of fence line per day. It means it's going to take them something like seven or eight months to complete this massive project. Each completed section, another brick in their wall. For us and our next generations, it's going to give us a future. In southwest Queensland, to Wilmington, Nine News. We know from individual landowners who have fenced their own properties, they had the capital up front to do that. But I've had six individual reports saying they paid it off in under two years, even during drought conditions. For these land uh, managers, that sort of capital up front is not possible. So to share the burden with their neighbours and work together has been a great solution for the problem that they all uh, share. Okay, so how we went about the process. So South West NRM asked interested groups of land managers to submit expressions of interest. Um, these were presented to board members and staff who made a decision on which groups were to be given a priority for funding. Um, this funding input is for 50% of the cost of the posts and the wire. Factors um, that were considered during the process um, were given a weighting and included those such as environmental benefit, economic return, the history of collaboration between landholders and the size and the shape of the cluster. Collaboration between land managers in the cluster groups was considered to be the most important deciding factor when determining which groups were to, were to receive funding. Getting a large group of land managers of different ages, backgrounds and experience to work together isn't easy. Land managers in successful groups are often asked how they succeeded in bringing, group, bringing a group together. And the answer they usually give is when people have the common goal of saving their livelihood, they'll do it. With regards to the monitoring of this project, uh, changes occurring both inside and outside of the clusters are being monitored to assess the impact of the exclusion fence and to evaluate the success of the project. As this is a pilot project, it's important to ensure that changes to the pasture health biodiversity and pest animal numbers are monitored. Key indicators of the success of the CAM project are a reduction in the number of wild dogs within the individual cluster areas and control over grazing pressure. The types of data that are being collected for this project are pasture monitoring, a passive tracking index for wild dogs and density estimates for macropods. Economic data including stocking rates and landing rates from land managers will be analysed along with data from local towns to assess greater community benefit from the CAM project. All monitoring is done on the inside and the outside of the clusters. So pasture monitoring, this is conducted two to three times per year to look at pasture health. Um, it looks at factors such as ground cover and whether this is organic or inorganic matter, soil erosion, species composition to see what percentage of the area is made up of desirables versus undesirable grasses, and the amount that has been grazed. 
This monitoring is done along a 50 metre transect in areas that are representative of the larger area. A passive tracking index can be established through the use of sand pads that are swept along a 50 to 60 kilometre transect. <coughs> this passive tracking index is not an estimate of dog numbers, but it's an index that tracks changes in population. These sand pads are swept approximately one metre wide across the road every one kilometre for the transect and they're checked every, uh, three consecutive days after that. This tracking is done three times per year in April May to coincide with the mating season, July, August as this is the time for peak macropod numbers and November to coincide with pups leaving the den and being on the ground. Density estimates taken from spotlighting data is used to monitor macropod numbers and similarly to the PTI, this form of data collection does not offer information on population estimates, but is rather a population density that can be compared over a number of years. Once this data has been reported, it's uploaded to a software program called Distance, and this program will provide density and abundance information. Early density estimates from the inside of one of the clusters indicates that there's approximately 80 kangaroos per square kilometre, and with a dry sheep equivalent of 0.7, that's roughly 56 sheep per square kilometre that land managers aren't able to run. Um, economic data uh, will be collected from a number of landholders in each cluster as well to determine economic success of the project. Information on stocking rates and lambing rates uh, will give an indication of grazing management and, and predation rates. Data collected from towns will highlight the impact the wool industry has previously had and is currently having um, on the economic viability of small towns. The sheep industry typically requires more people to be employed in an area, which means more children in local schools and more people in local housing. So to sum up, this exclusion fencing project is expected to offer a reduction in total grazing pressure and a reduction in predation on livestock, allowing land managers the opportunity to diversify the industry on their property. These two factors are the key to assessing the success of the project and it's believed that they will have far reaching benefits to the wider community. A further effect of reducing total grazing pressure and predation will be an increase in biodiversity values inside the clusters. As ground cover increases, as weed spread decreases, as damaged water supplies mend and its predation lessens, it's hoped that native animals and plants will have a far greater chance of survival inside these areas. And that's us done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Over the last 150 years, there have been numerous attempts at vermin-proof fencing. Um, what makes you confident this one will work? Um, so we're not trying to fence. This isn't for cats. This is an agriculture industry project, so we're really looking at um, predation of wild dogs. Um, so the actual style of the fence, it stands about 1.5 to 1.8 metres in height, and it's um, a netting-style fence. It has an apron at the bottom to prevent animals from digging underneath. So it's been proved to work on individual properties where people have been able to do it themselves um, and we're hoping it's going to be the same for the cluster concept. Individual landowners have said that uh, if they can keep out 80% of the dogs, they'll be happy with that at this stage. Uh, hello, uh, Paul Mitchell from Indigenous Land Corporation. I've just got a question about the, you put up a chart that talks about the biodiversity impacts of, um, of dingoes, of culling dingoes. Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about whether dingoes are an apex predator or a meso predator and whether they actually um, kill more cats and foxes or, or not just kill but displace cats and foxes and therefore have a biodiversity impact. I'd just like a comment on that if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this came up, uh, I went to the Bilby Summit um, a couple of weeks ago and this was discussed there as well. So especially in arid areas, um, wild dogs have been proven to keep down cat numbers. Um, it's maybe not so much out where we are. I don't have the figures, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not gonna make it up. But we have um, very high cat populations already and there is a lot of dogs. So it's not 100% sure where we are. But yes, I do agree in, in arid areas, um, they probably do help to control uh, cat numbers. I'm sure lots of people have got lots of questions. I know I do, so catch up with them later. Thanks very much. Thank you.